Right, well, let's start by saying hello. Hello, how are you? Very good. So, I'm Chris Fielden. This is Consuelo Rivera Fuentes. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. Well. Thank you. <laughs> practicing it, and I've got it correct, so that's great. Um, Consuelo is the uh, MD of Victorina Press, which is a small independent um, publisher in the UK. So to start with, can Consuelo, can I ask you to talk a little bit about your background and the areas of expertise you have in the writing world? So do you want my background only in the publishing world, or? Uh, no, maybe it might be interesting to hear, you know, where you where you were born where and I come from and all that. Here. Yeah, I was I was born in um, Santiago, Chile, um, but I lived most of my life in the second largest city, which is Concepcion, in the south, south of uh, Santiago. And um, I, I did all my studies there, and I, I became a, a teacher of English as a foreign language in, from the University of Concepcion. Um, then I did a, an MA, sorry, um, a Diplomado, as we call it, a diploma of uh, women's studies, and uh, as a postgraduate thing, and I worked for the um, Chilean British Institute in Concepcion, which at the time I was there depended on the British Council. So my connection to um, Great Britain started there, although way before that when I was younger um, it was the Beatles <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, lots of the songs from the Beatles helped um, my English although some of the songs were not grammatically correct or anything like that but that's how I, I started my passion for English started mm. so um, I worked as a teacher in secondary schools and then at, at that British, uh, Chilean British Institute, I became the director of studies and then I decided that I wanted to come and live here because I fell in love um, with a woman and I followed her. Um, very quickly she left me after that <laughs> and so we um, I, I had to decide whether to continue being here or whether to go back to Chile. At the time, I had Jorge, my son. He was five years old. And um, I decided that I wanted to continue. And um, so I, I did an MA in, women's, in sociology and women's studies. Then I did my PhD. Uh, in women's studies and um, I started working for the University of Lancaster um, teaching Spanish uh, but also teaching in the women's studies program oh. and um, after that I met my uh, current partner and I hope it's the last partner <laughs> and, and um, so we met at the university because she's also a, an academic and um, we went to live in uh, Wales in um, Glencairioc which is near Llangollen and uh, I worked there for colleges and stuff like that. I even worked at some point before I got to teach there in, um, in a house for people, uh, people with disabilities, so I was kind of cleaning toilets and that kind of stuff right, and right. helping the, the people who live there permanently. Um, and then I started working for the Open University uh, in, the, in both faculties, in the Social Sciences faculty and also in the Spanish faculty. First it was um, part-time. Um, and then I applied for a job at the actual campus and 
um, in Milton Keynes um, and I became full-time uh, in the Spanish department. So we were making the books that the Open University um, uses with the students. Uh, in this case, the, the books were for Spanish, learning Spanish. So um, there I became part of the publishing uh, of, the, of the books. So there was a little bit there already uh, about it, about publishing. And uh, then um, I worked there for several years and at the end of it, I, in 2016, um, I fell ill and uh, decided that I was going to um, resign. Uh, but instead of resigning, I just uh, retired because I was already 65. So I was of the age I could retire properly. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I thought, I, <laughs> I am not the kind of person who likes knitting <laughs> or doing that kind of stuff uh, and staying at home, which is, you know, this um, stereotype of retired people. Um, once you retire, actually, you have a lot of other things and interests that you would like to pursue. In my case, I'm, I've always been an academic and a writer. I'm a writer as well. I've published in Spanish, but I also published a lot uh, in academic um, magazines and journals and things like that. Um, and um, so I decided that I was going to study something to do with writing, to do with the publishing world. And I decided that I wanted to do it at Derby University, or the University of Derby, in an MA in publishing. So I was part of the, the first cohort of that um, course, because uh, they didn't have it before. So we were the guinea pigs, in a way. Um, and uh, I finished my my MA in 2017 and in the same year um, in about August I decided that I wanted to um, publish my first book and it's called um, well it's a bilingual anthology which um, resulted from um, a competition or a contest or I don't know how to call it an award right. um, for just for Latin American um, poets uh, who lived mainly in London and uh, so that was the result of that and and so that was my first published book and then my second more you know, with more experience, experience in inverted commas, um, because I had all the elements from the course, from the MA in publishing, um, I could do a little bit more than with the first one, which was very, uh, done with the heart, if mm. you see what I mean, um, but not really knowing what I was doing pretty much. Uh, but I did it with the help of some friends and um, we did it without having all those elements uh, of publishing, the publishing world. And, um, but my second book, which was published in December, that was uh, a novel um, by Rhiannon Lewis, a Welsh writer, and it was a historical um, fiction uh, novel um, and the interest was that it was based on the Chilean um, the Ch Chilean Civil War at that time the 1891 <coughs> sorry and um, so that one I devoted all my time to, to doing uh, and it was published in December that year 
So that's why I like that book very much, not only because of the theme, because it's also very um, good quality in terms of the content, because it's kind of historical and to do with Wales, um, England and um, Chile. Mm. So it, it kind of um, summarized my life in a way because coming from Chile, then living in, in Wales and living in the UK as well. So all that and traveling and all that. So yeah, there are many things that I could say about that book, but mainly that it is a very good book. Yeah. I remember that actually that was the first time I met you was at um, Rhiannon's book launch in the Chilean embassy in London. Yeah, that's right, yeah. 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 And at what point did you actually start Victorina Press? Was that just before you published your book or before you published Rhiannon's? Um, I started it uh, with like the name and I then I created a little website. Um, when I did the, the actual um, anthology of poetry, uh, but it was a name, it was, you know, it wasn't something that I thought it could go on forever, as I think now. Um, <laughs> so hopefully we will go on and I, I hope it will. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got lots and lots of authors now, so it's, it's looking yeah. that way. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the kind of ethos behind Victorina Press, uh, and in particular, the principles of bibliodiversity, you know, where that comes from and what that means to you and yeah. to you, the publisher? Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, I've always been interested in diversity in any um, part of society. Um, and I always felt that there was something missing uh, when I, you know, when writing for on my own um, poetry and short stories, which is what I mainly write about. And um, <clears throat> the opportunities for people um, who are not um, famous, first of all, <laughs> um, who are just starting their career as writers, um, who also come from diverse backgrounds, um, either because of their um, origins, uh, for let's say if they are poor or middle class or whatever, uh, which shouldn't influence really, um, but uh, what does influence the the access to being published um, race is one of those uh, immigration uh, or you know being an immigrant it's also very difficult to get a foot in this world of publishing now uh, i when i was doing my ma i came across uh, the concept of bibliodiversity <coughs> and I started reading about it um, and it's funny because uh, the concept came or it was coined or started with a um, group of independent publishers in Chile but I didn't know this um, I only knew about it when I uh, when I started doing some research on it. Um, so the first book that I, I read about uh, bibliodiversity was uh, Susan Hawthorne's book called Biblio, uh, The Manifesto of Bibliodiversity or something like that. I don't know whether I've got it here. Uh, yeah. Uh, that one. Okay, cool. Um, so it's the manifesto where she um, lays out all the tenets of what bibliodiversity is, first of all. But, uh, you know, I, I just came to be in love with the concept 
um, they decided that I wanted to do my research for my um, mini dissertation for the MA on a project with bibliodiversity. Um, and my project was to make a book rather than writing a longer thesis, which I had done three times already. Yeah. I my, you know, the one for being a teacher, then my MA and then my PhD, I had written thesis. Um, and I thought, well, I want to make a project and, you know, make a book and then reflect on all the process of publishing that book, what happened and so on. Um, so that's why I had to, um, you know, I read a lot about this, then I, I realized that there were other people, um, which is the international, um, I can't remember the, the name exactly, but it's, uh, it's international um, publishers and it's the bases are in kind of in France, in Britain, um, in Egypt, everywhere in the world, in Chile, in Argentina, and so on. And um, so I became involved in it little by little. And Susan Hawthorne actually helped me a lot. We became friends. We had, I had published with her before. Um, it, for her um, publishing uh, press, which um, is called Spinifex Press in Australia. So I had published something with her before, so I knew her, but as a publisher by name and so on. So I quickly wrote to her and I said that I wanted to use that um, book and uh, and could she could we have like an interview and so on so that's how our uh, friendship started and since we uh, you we've met here um and there was a conference last year which was a feminist conference and we presented uh, some papers together um also on, on publishing uh, feminist presses and so on um, so, um, but I'm coming out of the of the question. If I if I read to you um, what she says here, it says bibliodiversity is a complex, self-sustaining system of storytelling, writing, publishing, and other kinds of production of oratory and literature. The writers and producers are comparable to the inhabitants of an ecosystem. But bibliodiversity contributes to a thriving life of culture and a healthy social system. Um, <clears throat> now, it, when she talks about oratory and all that, it's, um, it's not just that it's oral. Sometimes, you know, they they publish things which start it as an oral thing, but it's it's a more complex thing that I don't want to go on in here. But that's the idea that the the bibliodiversity world is akin to um, the diversity that is in in the in the world in nature and so on. Um, so multiversity, which you have in your short stories. You have a yeah. multiverse there, um, and diversity as well. So, how, for example, in um, in a system in nature, you one um, system becomes part of another system. So, for example, um, a tree has the roots but then there is something that comes in and attaches to the tree and they both nurture each other and so on and so forth. Um, so the idea is to give public um, authors um, the opportunity to, in, in inverted commas, attach to the publisher 
and do things together, produce the book together, uh, and so on. And I must say that uh, Victorina Press is an independent publisher. We're very small. Um, and so we require or we need the help of the authors when they submit their um, books uh, to us or their manuscripts. Um, we ask them to collaborate with us, to cooperate, rather than sending us the manuscript and then forgetting about them for 10 months or sometimes two years in big companies, the, the publishers um, don't go back to the author until the book is ready. So there is nothing um, between them until then. So the, the publisher gets all the uh, the things ready without telling the author or asking the author for their um, opinion on things, including the cover. They can, although the contract says that the ultimate word is, is or decision comes from the publisher, we decide on what cover we use and uh, what illustrator we use or designer and so on. Uh, but we don't really, it's just to have something like a backup. But we are asking the, the writers all the time to give us their feedback. And if they have a particular topic or a particular image, for example, that they want to use for the cover, then we take it from there and we negotiate. So we're always collaborating with the writers. Um, and we also ask them to do their own marketing and stuff like that. But we try to help them. Um, so that's why it is different in that way. And more and more uh, publishers, including now the big ones, um, are getting the, the point of uh, bibliodiversity. Um, so in, in about two years, this has become big. And I realized, for example, that the, <coughs> uh, the Arts Council, the English Arts Council, um, are using bibliodiversity as their background as well now. Um, I'm, I've commissioned a translator for a, a book which was written originally in Spanish, a novel, um, and uh, we decided to translate it into English, but we haven't got the money to pay for the translation, which is quite a lot of money, uh, and then having to produce the book and so on. Um, so there was a, there is a, a an, it's not an award, it's like a sponsorship or something like that from the uh, pen, uh, pen the arts uh, that is within the arts council, uh, pen translates, and they're giving um, help towards paying for this. Um, and I've applied. I don't know whether I I got it because they don't give the results until October. Right. Uh, so I don't know whether they have. A, a, you know, given me the that, and all that money that they give goes to the actual translator. Nothing goes to the publisher. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and they are in the process of applying for this uh, pen translate. Um, I realized that one of the things I think it's thirty percent of of the criteria that they use to to uh, do this is um, whether you use bibliodiversity. So it is a very important thing. Sorry, it was a very convoluted. No, song. no, it's, it's really interesting to hear it because I, because I work with you, I quite often get asked, what does bibliodiversity mean to me? And it's really interesting to actually hear that much depth about it. Yeah. I mean, from the other side, as an author, it's lovely working with a publisher like you, 
for all the reasons you've just said because we get we get some input you feel like you're part of the team and personally I'm quite proactive with marketing and like to work with other people yeah, so it yeah. really suits me as an individual which is what I like about it and and you have such a diverse range of authors as well it's really yeah. nice to be part of that team and it's not just all white men like me <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, and interesting that you say that because at first um, my first year um, apart from the anthology which has um, some men in the in the with poems um, it's um, it's mainly women mm. but in the second and this year uh, it, it's a mixture of men and women um, and I've got some very interesting uh, things coming up um, like from exiled people exiled writing ink or something like that right. um, which is for asylum seekers and so on and people who have been exiled and they this there is a very interesting one that uh, will come out next year it, it's about a crime novel um, but the crime happens in Palestine um, but it becomes kind of um, buried under the, the carpet of um, you know what is happening in Gaza um, no. so nobody kind of talks about a crime happening there they think oh well they were killed by Jewish people or whatever you know Jewish people is not the right uh, word in this case but um, so a, a novel a crime happening a murder you know happening in in uh, in Gaza which happened there because some there was a murderer but it doesn't mean that it was in the in the conflict that they yeah. have yeah. so it's a very interesting novel and um, <clears throat> so that's there are several men now that we have Steve Jenkins yeah. um, with his um, some people say vigilante kind of novel um, um, but it's very good uh, happening in Warsaw um, it's you with your short stories which have become very very um, nicely promoted and so on and and your the style of writing which is funny witty and uh, you know about death for yeah. example. Um, and um, and so on but at the beginning as I said it was just by chance mainly women only women mm. um, publishing and uh, so there was a, a big kind of melting pot if you see what I mean we had um, Nasrin Parvas with her um, two, first her novel um, letters from X to A and um, and then uh, her memoir which is a prison memoir of the years she spent in in prison in in Iran um, and uh, which is very moving but very very well written as well yeah. so um, and then we had um, someone from the United States uh, Daniel Maisano you know so uh, there is th there are women from different backgrounds and so on um, very soon I will have um, two more people who were come from um, asylum seekers um, background uh, and they both of them are poetry uh, one who lives here in uh, Shropshire well I'm not in Shropshire anymore <laughs> I'm in Staffordshire now um, and uh, her name is Noah Morgan and she's written a, uh, a book of poetry it, it's a pamphlet a um, poetry pamphlet very good um, and you know how she rebels a little bit 
against the impositions of her culture as a, uh, on her as a woman. Um, so uh, the name, I think, is I am the power you undermine. Which wow. is a very nice uh, yeah. title that comes from one of the verses in one of her poems. Um, and, uh, and then there is another one who has been in this country for a long time and she is in London and it's, um, you know, from the Exile Writers Inc. Society to which I also belong. Mm. So yeah. it's varied. Yeah, it's nice that it's not just the authors, but it's actually the types of written work that you publish. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just novels, it's memoirs, it's poetry, it's short stories. And yeah. it's nice that you don't ignore all those um, mediums that don't necessarily get picked up by larger publishers unless you're famous. Yeah, exactly. One of the things that Bibliodiversity, the manifesto, this manifesto, talks about is precisely about sameness in the publishing world. So they are all seeking the latest um, Harry Potter. And so then there is a kind of tendency, a, a trend of, to write in the same way as Harry Potter to become successful, mm. successful author. So in a way they're copying the style of writing because they want to achieve success immediately and sell thousands and millions of copies. Um, so that to me is sameness. Um, I don't want that sameness. I want diversity. I want difference. Because a lot of people are afraid of um, difference. Uh, but that's what makes us human. Um, and if we can live together with and um, with our differences, then that's the world I want to live in. Yeah. And I think with what's going on in the real world at the moment, that's even more poignant than it would be otherwise. Yeah. Um, just moving on slightly, you know, Victorine Press is a small family business, yeah. and I'm sure that presents its own challenges. What, what, are the, what are the pros and cons of working closely with your family? Well, um, you know, Jorge is my son, um, and he was very reluctant at the beginning to come in and help me. Um, not because of the money, which is not a lot. <laughs> um, and they, people think that they work full time for me, but actually they don't. They don't in paper, on paper. They, but they do work uh, more and more. They're working full time, but receiving a pay as part time because I haven't got the money to pay them um, full time, which I would like. I would love to. Um, but the challenges in that case was that, for example, with Jorge, he didn't want to start working for me at the beginning because he said, if we have a disagreement on how to do things, and so then we're going to start falling, uh, you know, um, into arguments and things like that, which otherwise we wouldn't fall into. Um, but uh, eventually, um, he came in. Um, so the first person to start um, with me was actually Sophie. And Sophie um, came first as a, I think she was a friend with her at the time. Uh, and then they became uh, partners. Um, sorry, I'm, maybe I'm talking too much about their life. <laughs> oh, no. As long as they don't mind, it's fine. <laughs> sorry, Jorge and Sophie. Um, <laughs> And so, in, from that point of view, yes, it, it, it could create some um, trouble uh, on occasions, but actually they have been very, very um, helpful, supportive, and so on, because uh, last year I was diagnosed with cancer, and um, it was a very aggressive cancer. So there was a time in which I couldn't do anything because I was having operations, I was having um, the chemotherapy, and it was impossible for me to oversee everything that you have to when you are the managing director 
uh, where I, I kind of read the books uh, or the manuscripts, I decide whether they, they can be uh, published or whether they need to improve and then come back again um, to see the standards. Um, I'm also having to oversee a lot of other things, uh, the production, the costs, the printing, um, and so on, the cover, arranging cover with uh, the illustrators and so on. So um, from that point of view, it was um, very good that they were here. Um, and um, <laughs> just someone coming in. And um, so it's a pro that they are family because otherwise I couldn't ask them to to take over without pay, giving them a pay rise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but obviously sometimes if there is something that I don't think is working properly, um, even if I try to say it in, in very gentle ways, um, it might be construed as if I'm criticizing them uh, and feel it like that because I am the mother and the mother-in-law. So, which probably they wouldn't do if they worked with someone else and they would accept the criticism. But here there is a kind of a tension sometimes. Um, and that happens more with my son than with Sophie. Um, and uh, because probably because we are also very much like each other uh, culturally and so on. although culturally Jorge is British you know he arrived here when he was five so um, but still there are things genetic I suppose <laughs> that, <laughs> that can make things go like that but um, funnily enough you say it's a family business it, it could be a family business still but this coming Friday we are uh, we had interviewed someone for um, marketing because I think we need someone to do that for us um, because the, the, there are, having more and more authors and more and more books to produce, it's difficult to also do the marketing yeah. at the same time. So um, we had decided um, to get someone else part-time and temporary um, to see whether it works or not and um, because of the whole situation we did the interviews and everything well Jorge and Sophie did I couldn't because I was ill yeah. um, so they did um, and um, they decided on someone and when they they had said okay we would like this person to start then the whole thing with the COVID-19 started and we said no we cannot do it because I don't know whether we will have enough money to pay that person and so on and so forth and yes I, I think it it was a wise decision because um, even with new marketing skills and, and things going on events and so on it, it would have been impossible to do more than what we do mm. um, which is mainly online at the moment um, and we would have had to be paying someone uh, when we didn't have the money because during all this time we've had books um, that people have bought and so on but the number or the amount of books that we sell is much much lower than I, th I think everyone's seen situation. that. Yeah, I've noticed it because I, I I work with you guys, but I also self-publish as well. My my sales are about half yeah. what they would be normally. Yeah, yeah. So it would have it, it was a wise decision from that point of view. Um, but now we decided that okay, let's call that person again, um, and maybe start working with her. Um, so uh, she's coming this Friday and we'll have a talk about how to go from here. 
Excellent. So, Sophie will be pleased because it'll give, it'll give me someone else to hassle instead of her. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and the other authors as well to say, okay, let's not bother for Suelo. Uh, let's talk directly to this other person. Um, um, and one, one last question about Victorina Press. Where, where do you see it going in the longer term now? Because obviously it, it's established now, so yeah. what's going to happen, do you think? Um, well, it depends. First, we have to sell the books. We have lots of books. Um, but I see myself, for example, and Victorina Press uh, going to open a little bit more into the academic world as well. Okay. Um, so for that, I've already got a, a book commissioned. Well, not commissioned. I didn't commission it. Uh, you know, it was submitted to us as an idea. And um, it's, uh, so that will be our first academic book. Um, and maybe opening a little bit more into also the, the children's uh, area. But sometimes I think uh, you have to try and focus on one or two areas of publishing. So maybe in future, I would say, okay, let's concentrate only on publishing, I don't know, novels, fiction, and um, memoirs. I, I'm just making it up. Yeah. But trying to concentrate on one or two specific genres of uh, literature and see what happens rather than trying to, you know, open it to a big or, you know, large. Um, I, guess, I guess you might run into the danger of spreading yourself too thin if you take too much on. That's right, yeah. So that's how I see myself going into the future. So we have to have a meeting at some point after we've done all the books that we have, we are producing at the moment. Um, that's why we have closed the submissions um, for this year and next, because we have plenty to to publish, um, and you know the contracts have already been written and signed, so we need to comply with those. But after that, I think we need to sit down and say, right, what has given us the most in terms of what people want to read? and you know take it from there and say right let's do only fiction or let's do only children or something like that yeah. um, but it's not decided yet and also uh, talking about the future I don't know what will happen with me <laughs> because unfortunately my cancer has come back so I have to um, probably in August start with chemotherapy again and uh, so I don't know how long I will be uh, going on, but I would like Victorina Press to go on. Um, and I would like, you know, the team to go on doing this. So, um, and I'm not being, um, what's the word, pessimistic. On the contrary, this is what keeps me going, you know, working. It's almost like service, but it's not a service because it helps me as well. So. Yeah, yeah, I can totally understand that. And it, it, I mean, I I always call Jorge George, but George and Sophie, or Jorge and Sophie, they seem so vested in in what you do. I. Yeah. I'd be surprised if they didn't want to continue it. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least they they have lots of books that will be left and they would have to at least sell them before yeah. they try to close it. But no, I, I would like it to continue and I know that my partner um, would like it to continue so she probably would help them as well. That's so, good. no, no problem there. I think I see Victorina in the future there. Yeah, that's really good to hear. Um, right, so I've got some questions for you from some authors who are members of the Facebook group that I'm involved with. So I'll put them to you next, if that's okay. So the first question is from Mary Fox, 
uh, Mary said, agents versus direct submissions. Have things changed? And what is your advice to writers? So do you prefer to receive submissions from an agent or from a writer or both? Um, normally, well, all the time, actually, I don't accept uh, submissions from agents. Um, and one of the reasons is because um, agents, obviously, they have to look after their own interests as well as the authors, um, which is good for a writer's, from a writer's point of view, you know, to have someone who can negotiate um, a contract with a publishing house. So, um, but for a small independent press like Victorina Press, we cannot, for example, give advances on the royalties. So the writers sign a contract where they say, um, you know, that they will get their royalties if they sell the books and so on. Um, but I cannot give any money in advance of those royalties. Whilst an agent would uh, want um, to negotiate advances, they would want more uh, percentage of royalties and so on and so forth. And sometimes um, they they go for things which are almost impossible for an independent small press like Victorina Press, um, which are good for the writer if they are presented to big companies, uh, publishing presses. Um, but they're not for independent publishers, um, unless they have a lot of money, obviously. Yeah. Um, in which case, they can negotiate that thing. So Victorina Press does not accept agents um, with manuscripts submitted by agents. And I've had a couple of them coming and writing, and I say, well, um, this is very nice, thank you very much, and, but I cannot accept an agent. And they understand. Mm. The, the, um, I think the, um, for, from the writer's point of view, an agent is good in that they, first they have to veto the manuscript. They have to say whether they like it or not, why, and so on. And then if they accept it, it's because it's good. So that, from that point of view, is good. Um, and also, then they have to promote the book and send it to different publishers who accept agents and uh, try to get the most um, of the contract with those companies. So I'm not against agents, but as Victorina Press, I cannot accept them because I don't have the means, the economic means to do that. That's actually really interesting because in some because a lot of people like to go down the traditional route of getting an agent, but actually they might be closing the door on opportunities with smaller publishers. I'd never actually thought of it like that before. Yeah, yeah. Really interesting. Uh, the next question is from Michael Rumsey, uh, who lives out in Greece, I think. Actually, upon receiving a new manuscript, are you able to say quickly, "I like it because of A, B, and C"? Or conversely, this is not for me because of X, Y, Z. Uh, is it that simple or is it more complicated than that? Uh, I, normally, when I read a manuscript, I know from the first two chapters whether I like it or not. Um, for example, when you submitted your short stories, I laughed uh, so much with the first story, for example. Mm. Uh, ooh. I want to read more and more and more and, and I continue laughing but at the same time finding things which were interesting to um, as a human being and thinking about death and stuff like that. Um, so I would normally know whether something is worth publishing from the first two or three chapters. But I've also had uh, an occasion um, said yes to something and then actually when I read it completely I realized mm, no but then 
because that's already been done, I say, well, let's try and edit it um, and try to keep it up to, to um, good standards. Mm -hmm. But it does happen sometimes, especially in my last year when I really didn't have the, the time to, or I had all the time, but I didn't have the energy yeah. um, to, to read everything. So sometimes I would just read the first three chapters and say yes or no. Um, but also I think if I want now, if I want to actually um, see whether I want to publish this, I, I really um, read the whole manuscript before mm. I give my, my um, decision. Um, some big companies, um, they have special editors or readers who will read the manuscript and then they have a meeting uh, with the whole team that would produce that book and that editor or reader that is part of the press would try and push the, the book forward to the, um, the committee that the production uh, committee, for example, to say, yes, I want this book because of this, that and the other. Um, but um, we don't do that. So it's mm. mainly me who makes the decisions. But also um, you have to think in terms of, okay, I like this book, but um, I don't think it will sell a lot. And that's when you have to start putting on your hat of bibliodiversity and say, yes, okay, this book will not sell a lot, but I am interested in publishing this voice. So that's one of the criteria, mm. criteria for me because uh, I am not someone who is um, publishing for profit. It would be nice, <laughs> but I'm publishing because of what I believe in. Yeah. Um, so um, sometimes I publish things knowing that it won't be um, a big success or anything, but it would give voice, a different voice mm. to um, the publishing world. Um, so that's one of the criteria. Um, and then uh, the other one is that if there is anything in the manuscript that goes against my own beliefs, then I wouldn't do it. So if someone is, um, I don't know, um, violence against women just pers because it's, uh, you know, it's different to have a memoir, let's say, by Nasri, yeah. who is very violent against women, right? Um, but it's not, it, it's real life, it's happened, and it's not actually justifying on the contrary, it is, mm. um, you know, say, denouncing what was happening. Um, but if someone does it for the sake of being violent against women, then no, because I'm a feminist as well. Yeah. Um, so um, that's one thing, and anything that goes against my own beliefs, you know, if they don't agree with me, that I, I don't care. Mm. But if they are going to publish with me, they need to think about that racism, um, you know, um, or even against um, lesbians, bisexual, etc., LGBT yeah. community. Then anything which is great. What's the word? Gratuitously. Uh, gratuitous, yeah. Yeah. Um, no. If it happens because life happens like that, it's different to something that is there because they want it. It's a thriller. And so yeah. they're going to, I'm going to put this against this, that, and the other. But no, that's not my style. Mm. So there are lots of different things that influence what uh, yeah. my you know, accepting or not. Yeah, so it's, it's not a simple 
No. This is a yes and this is a no. no. Great, thank you. Uh, so the next question is from Sarah Mosdale. And Sarah says, how do you try to ensure that you publish books from writers who are underrepresented because of their ethnicity, disability, or other such social factors? We've kind of covered that, but is there is there anything you want to add to it? Um, well, I'm not to looking for someone uh, with any possible characteristic or background, but they, it happens to come to me, and uh, if I feel that that's underrepresented, then I I take it very seriously. I read the manuscript very seriously. But equally, if, even if it is someone with a disability, for example, um, who I know has had lots of troubles writing the, the story or, or the poems or whatever, um, I take it very seriously. I read it, but if I don't like it... You don't publish it, yeah. No. Um, so I try to be fair in that sense um, because, you know, We've had someone uh, who writes murder stories, um, who, uh, her series is um, Blind, so it says Blind Witness, and now we're publishing Bl uh, Blind Pool, which is from the series of that. And her husband is blind, and she doesn't actually, he doesn't, I think he doesn't like it, that we don't say blind. Um, right. because it kind of tends to gloss over lots of things and there are of course all the um, politically correct things like uh, partially sighted or and so on and so forth. Visually impaired is one of them isn't yeah, it? Yeah visually impaired and so on and so forth. No they just wanted to say blind. Um, so uh, we try to to do um, justice to everybody but obviously it's impossible to, to yeah. do it for everybody yeah uh, but I'm willing yeah. I said to even give more consideration to um, those underrepresented um, people writers uh, but that doesn't mean that I will accept everybody just because yeah yeah well that's great because you're, you're giving people a chance and that's what's yeah. been missing in yeah. the past yeah yeah okay great uh the next question is from gail wareham everett and she says do you well we've covered this as well a bit but do you do you allow the writer any input when it comes to the design or general appearance of the book cover or is it handled solely by your team um well i yeah. i know from working with you that it you know i i came to you with a book cover that i'd already commission from an artist so I got I was lucky and I know we made a few tweaks to it but uh, Especially because of my feminism <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly yeah but it was great to actually have that input because the last thing I would have wanted to do was offend anyone just if I hadn't <laughs> thought of it you know what I mean yeah so from from that extreme you know you know does it vary do you sometimes take control of the cover completely or or how does it work no, they, they usually, as I said, in the contract, it says that the, the last word is the publishers um, on the cover and how we produce, how many books we publish, uh, print and so on. It's all on our decision. But uh, in, pr uh, in practicality, we, um, we actually work with the, with the uh, writer or writers. Um, so uh, if they have uh, an image that we like then we say yes let's use this and then we just um, ask our illustrator or um, designer to use the image that they provide um, I've got a very good um, illustrator designer Fiona um, she's an um, Austrian woman who used to be my um, classmate in my MA and uh, I noticed her immediately when 
you know, we started doing things and so this woman is very good at what she's, she does. And uh, she is, she does most of our covers. But um, recently also we've commissioned someone else because she's too busy. She's so good that she doesn't have the time to do things. And sometimes also it's difficult and this is, I don't know, it, it's difficult because um, she's in Austria um, and so to pay her we have to pay her in, in euros and to a, a bank account which is I don't know anyway but uh, it, it does work it does work and I really like her she's extremely talented um, but the authors give their input so she sent drafts and she said do you like this do you like that and, and uh, then I leave the author and the illustrator to work together and once they've decided this is what we want then they then I intervene they send me the the exchange of emails and so on about the particular cover um, or illustration and then once they they've discussed everything and they come to an agreement then they send it to me and then I might say something but I'm not um, a person who I, I don't know how I just do stick drawings <laughs> so, yeah but I can appreciate covers I can appreciate art in general but it's not that I am one of those mm -hmm. um, so I, I can say well could you put this in a different color and so on and so forth so um, at the moment, for example, Fiona and Gail Aldwin are working on a children's book and that is a long process because Fiona has to um, liaise, first read what Gail wanted to say in the story, which might be very little in inverted commas, but it actually very well thought, uh, how am I going to present this story to this child? Um, you know, if this child is three years old. Yeah. Um, so, um, and then they discuss this with the illustrator and um, it's been a long, long process because then they say, oh yes, but pandas have five digits, not four, and so on and so forth. So it's a very close relationship between the illustrator and the, and the, and the author. And I've always thought that it should actually be on the cover, um, illustrated by. Yeah. Because that person is also uh, helping the story to grow mm. and to develop into something which wasn't the original thought. So, yes, um, but to go back to your question, yes, we do even ask about the typesetting. So... Um, for example, for um, depending on the on the actual uh, theme, then Jorge or Heidi, who also helps sometimes with typesetting, they um, they they read what it is and they think, okay, this is Victorian. Let's do it with this type of uh, font, letter, and so on, face, um, and. And they can present, let's say, um, a chapter and say, do you like the way in which the chapter titles are set out? Uh, or do you prefer a different kind of font? And so on. So there is also some kind of negotiation there between the writer and the typesetter. That's, um, that's really good because I don't, well, I haven't, I'd never worked with a large publisher, but I would have, I don't know whether authors get that kind of input. No, normally they don't. Normally. Normally. So. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, last question is from Leslie Ann Truchet, and she says, how much of your time nowadays is dedicated to your writing activities rather than your publishing activities? <laughs> yeah. Everybody, including Jorge and Sophie, have said, when are you going to publish your own books? Um, and yes, I, I have here in my mind, okay, I need to publish this, that and that. 
for my own writing. But then I, I'm always kind of putting the other writers first, and then I never do. Um, so, but even my son, my other son who lives in Chile, I said, Mom, I want to read your, your story possibly because he wants to know more about who I am and, and so on. Mm. Although they know me as sons, they, they, there are things about myself that they want to know about. Um, so that would be from the point of view of memoir or something like that. But I, I've published books uh, in, you know, like poetry books and so on. Um, and I've got lots of poems that I haven't sat down to say, okay, let's put all this together in a pamphlet or something like that so but i will <laughs> at yeah. some point i will <laughs> it's on your list of things to do yeah yeah <laughs> that's brilliant well thank you for your time um I have one last thing have you, before we finish have you got any final pearls of wisdom that you'd like to share with writers that are trying to get their work published um <clears throat> Well, <laughs> I would be saying something which I don't apply to myself, which is, you know, write, 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 and then, uh, um, then do the editing. But sometimes, you know, we, we, are, um, criti we are critics of our own writing, and as we are writing, we are criticizing that sentence in particular, and then we don't go on, and then the writer's block happens. Um, instead of just writing whatever comes in, that you have it more or less formed, but you don't want it to be um, the first manuscript to be um, perfect. Because then you have time to edit, you leave it for a month, then you go back to it, and then do another editing, and then you go back to it, and then, and the, <clears throat> the other thing is that we, it's like children of your own. You don't want to to kill your children or, or to change them, transform them, you know, if you want them to develop into people, persons, uh, different people to yourself, then you just let them do it. Um, but uh, so the same happens with the, your books that uh, you want them to be perfect, but they will never be perfect. There will always be someone who will criticize and, um, and criticize in a negative way. But um, if one publisher doesn't uh, um, accept your manuscript, doesn't mean that it is bad. It means that perhaps to that publisher, the book is not convenient for all sorts of reasons that we talked about before. Um, but if you believe in your manuscript, then um, send it to another publisher and another publisher. I mean, the same um, Harry Potter's, uh, what's her name? Uh, J.K. Rowling. Yeah. Um, she had her manuscript um, rejected many, many, many times until a small press decided, okay, let's publish this one. And now she's a billionaire. <laughs> Not even a millionaire, she's a, mil a billionaire. Um, so uh, believe in yourself. Believe in, if you believe in yourself, in what you're writing and what your way of writing is, right, then go for it. And rejection will happen. Um, but just go on with it. That would be my my advice. Perfect. A perfect way to end this conversation. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks very much for your time, Consuelo. That's brilliant. Thank you for interviewing. And hopefully I'll get to see you soon when lockdown is actually over. Yeah, good. Well done. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>